A couple of days ago, The Great Reset, an initiative coming from the World Economic Forum, was trending on Twitter. I doubt they were pleased because it was mostly people saying that it's a plan for, quote, totalitarian rule by a global technocratic elite. Now, although those memes are overstating the story for effect, this is a real and important struggle between a globalisation mindset and a localised one that people really should know about. And the fact that there's such a loud backlash has itself become part of the story. Let's dive in and see what it's all about. The annual event at Davos, where the global elites gather to talk about world trends and what should be done about them, that has been a regular fixture in the calendar now for decades. When the anti-capitalist left in the 1990s were first rioting about what they felt to be the impact of capitalism on the poor, the World Economic Forum meetings in Davos were one of their targets. And the annual summits have had great cachet. The top leaders and power brokers want to be able to network with their peers at them. Some want to talk big ideas, others just want to do deals. Campaigners love to be seen there, swaggering about in the shadow of the big beasts. These events cover many themes. They get inputs from some of the best connected people about emerging global trends. They get inputs from a variety of experts and campaigners about the biggest issues. Some of it matters. A lot of it doesn't. Some of the discussions pick up on important aspects that go on to shape our world. Others turn out to be fashionable fluff that quickly and probably deservedly fades away. But the basic principle that people in charge of governments, global corporations and the like, that they should have a forum where they take an interest in the well-being of a wider community and ask what positive difference they should make. I can't argue with that. In theory. What we're finding out now is that while many might accept that it's a good thing in principle, as the backlash to globalisation has grown, so too have suspicions that such gatherings might not be able to be trusted to arrive at conclusions that are wholly benign. And even if the intentions are benign, although those suspicions may have attached themselves to some outlandish caricatures based on decidedly non-benign designs, they're neither irrational nor baseless. And I say this gently because a lot of people have become utterly convinced that the worst reports are true. Let's talk briefly about the most alarmist versions that have been circulating. For instance, that one written by James Dellingpole and published by Breitbart. He said this. Build back better means totalitarian rule by a global technocratic elite as constrictive and immiserating as life under fascism or communism. This hideous new world order is the Great Reset. That's obviously a very strong claim, so we expect it to be backed up with equally strong evidence. He goes on to say this. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but the people behind it are perfectly open about it. He provides a link on that point, but all it points to is a video of a panel discussion where nobody says they want totalitarian rule or anything similar. And he says things like, Ah yes, they're serious about abolishing ownership. Here's their website boasting about their plans back in 2016. Another link. That links to one of the texts that is being the most quoted in the various videos and tweets about the Great Reset. It's titled, Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. Which does sound a little bit like my trip to East Germany before the wall came down. But anyway, the implication of all the tweets is that this is the settled intent of this shadowy band of power brokers. It goes on this way. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say, our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you consider the product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free, so it ended up not making sense for us to own much. There it is, says Dellingpole and many of us beside, and they quote Karl Marx saying that the short summary definition of communism is abolish private property. But 
This text is not a declaration of intent by the global elites. It's a discussion blog post by a Danish member of parliament, Ida Orkin. The World Economic Forum website has a very active blog where they invite lots of different people to contribute their thoughts and ideas about the future. At the bottom of the blog post, as for all of their contributions, they have a familiar disclaimer. The views expressed in this article are those of the author alone and not the World Economic Forum. So what we have is a discussion piece with a sort of clickbaity title designed to provoke your interest. And it may be pretty utopian, highly unrealistic, but I do recognise the discussion expressed in that blog and where it comes from. Lots of businesses are trying to work out how to be successful in a world where we waste less, which we know we have to do, right? We have seen the tech revolution provide a number of models where this has happened by changing the process of owning a thing to one of paying for a service. It already happened when it comes to music. My generation bought albums, vinyl and then CDs. I know, I'm really old. We owned them. We resisted for years the idea that we should pay instead for streaming services because we wanted to own our music. But eventually you notice that for the price of one CD per month, you can listen to anything that you want to, whenever you want to listen to it, which is actually a better service. So it becomes the norm. Nobody thinks it's particularly communist in principle. Neither that blog poster nor the World Economic Forum from anything that I've seen, and if I've missed anything, then let me know, is suggesting that that process should be or could be imposed on people from above. And as we know, such models will only work if what they offer is demonstrably better than what they're replacing. You could see that it could work in, for instance, fashion. In the West, the average number of times that a woman will wear a garment that she buys new is seven, just seven, after which it goes to the back of a wardrobe, never to be seen again. You could see in that situation how it might make sense to be able to hire the highest quality fashionable dresses that you want. Then after you've worn them a few times, you swap them for the next thing. And the lure is that you're wearing really high quality fashionable clothes, but all for a low monthly subscription. Would that work? Well, maybe. Only if it made sense to the customer and they wanted it. Would it count as the abolition of private property? Well, no. But you can see why people would think so, because of the blog title and the fact that so many people look at her blog posts and see a vision of a deeply dystopian future. That tells you that it clearly wouldn't go that far. But it's a typical future forecasting blog post. When people write such things, they look at current visible trends and then they make the mistake that the, uh, the trend's going to keep going in a straight line and soon it will encompass everything. It's not really how those trends work, obviously. There's no logic why it would ever apply to your home ownership, for instance. So it's not a very insightful blog. But you know, not actually evil. One of the things that has people convinced that there really is some underground coordination comes from the emergence of the phrase build back better. The rationale of the Great Reset in the context of a pandemic is that the crisis has created huge disruption, unarguable, and destroyed a part of the status quo. We shouldn't let a crisis go to waste. Now is the opportunity to build back better. Figures on both the left and the right have used it. Joe Biden used it as his campaign slogan. That Twitter flurry a couple of days ago came because Justin Trudeau used it, along with The Great Reset in a short video of his. Boris Johnson used it. The Prince of Wales used it. Neither of those are figures that you would associate with a global communist takeover. The question is, is this really evidence of a common plan? Or is it evidence of an attraction to a positive sounding phrase appropriate for the time, but really could mean anything that you want it to mean? Do we really think that when Boris Johnson says we should aim to build back better, he means the same as what Justin Trudeau means? What about President Macron or Angela Merkel? Macron, Merkel and Trudeau were all part of an event that was themed as building back better. So it's not a surprise that there's video footage of them referencing the theme of the event they're speaking at. Politicians like business leaders attend these sorts of events and cherry pick whatever makes sense to their situation and whatever they think will work with their particular audience. To take a single phrase or a couple of phrases 
and translate a common reaction by influential people to the power of a very vague concept and turn that into a global conspiracy to specifically abolish private property on a Marxist agenda and figures on the left and the right and inherited monarchy to boot, they're all going to sign up to it. Let's just say I would need a little bit more concrete evidence than anyone's been able to give me so far. So what does the principal author of The Great Reset mean by it? Even if the cartoon version isn't right, are there things that we should be alarmed by or at least arguing against? In his book COVID-19 The Great Reset, Klaus Schwab puts forward his ideas around the context of his thinking and what he means by The Great Reset. It's probably reasonable to look there and see if we can take this to a different level of discussion. As always with these videos, we go in without preconceptions, looking to the substance. And bear in mind, Schwab has spent a couple of decades at the heart of a network that pulls together a lot of the world's leaders and thinkers. He's been in on a lot of interesting conversations. So even if he came to conclusions that we would disagree with, the journey should be quite an interesting one. All right, he starts off talking about three prevailing forces that he says are shaping the world. One, interdependence. Because of technology and international travel plus global trade, our systems are more tied together than ever before. It's kind of unarguable. Two, velocity. Because of the same technology and globalisation, things now move faster than ever before. There's a culture of immediacy. That can be seen in how quickly crises and social discontent can spread, how technology gets adopted, how information spreads, and of course, also how the latest infectious disease spread. And this has effects, impatience, pressure for decision makers to move before all the information is known, and so on and so on. And then three, complexity. Complexity he defines as what we don't understand or find difficult to understand. Complex systems are often characterised by an absence of visible causal links. Predicting their behaviour becomes virtually impossible. Tracing causes for why things have happened, likewise. So far, those are all things most of us would recognise in the world as it is today. Then he introduces the changes that he thinks are coming. Economic reset, societal reset, geopolitical reset, environmental and technology resets. And this is a lot about how consequences will flow, not specifically about their proactive agenda. He then talks about the economic impact that Covid has had and is likely to go on to have and speculates about whether an economic reset is needed to cope. And we become a world unlike the world of the past. We saw a rapid growth in population and technology. If the future is going to be marked by a more stable population, as seems to be the case, then does GDP growth continue to make sense as a measure of progress? He asked the questions, what should the new compass for tracking progress be in a world that doesn't grow in the way that it used to? What will the new drives of a more inclusive and sustainable economy be? There are other global economic questions, such as whether the US dollar will remain the global currency reserve in the future, given the significant addition of COVID-related debt that may impact upon the trust that the world will have in the dollar's stability. And then asking what would happen if it did decline, because there'd be lots of knock-on effects, lots more than we have time to go into in this video. On the societal reset, he predicts that there'll be major changes in many countries post-Covid, but it's too early to take what form that will take. He says this, First and foremost, the post-pandemic era will usher in a period of massive wealth redistribution from the rich to the poor and from capital to labour. Secondly, COVID-19 is likely to sound the death knell of neoliberalism, a corpus of ideas and policies that can loosely be defined as favouring competition over solidarity, creative destruction over government intervention and economic growth over social welfare. For a number of years, the neoliberal doctrine has been on the wane, with many commentators, business leaders and policymakers increasingly denouncing its market fetishism. But COVID-19 brought the coup de grace. 
It's no coincidence that the two countries that over the past few years embraced the policies of neoliberalism with the most fervour, the US and the UK, are amongst those that suffered the most casualties during the pandemic. Now the first part of that is just an acknowledgement of what's happened with most governments supporting citizens affected by the pandemic with large slabs of public money which they will recoup through taxes and probably with a heavier weight on those with most to give. Are we quite at the death knell of neoliberalism? I think there might be some wishful thinking in there. And if you have people thinking that the Great Reset is drawing from the ideas of the left, it's probably that part amongst others maybe that you would particularly point to. But he feels that it's likely to come. Not least that because we will see an age of significantly enhanced social unrest. All the people who the pandemic has left hopeless, jobless and without assets could easily turn against those who are better off, he says. This leads him to suggest that we'll see the return of big government. He quotes John Micklethwaite and Adrian Waldridge saying, The Covid-19 pandemic has made government important again. Not just powerful again, look at those once mighty companies begging for help, but also vital again. It matters enormously whether your country has a good health service, competent bureaucrats and sound finances. Good government is the difference between living and dying. On the geopolitical front, he talks about a lot of change that's going on. The decline of the US as the single global power, which has replaced a period of stability with uncertainty. There's always going to be structural stress that occurs when there's a rising power, China, rivalling a ruling power, America. More and more countries that relied on global public goods provided by the US, for instance sea lane security, the fight against international terrorism, will now have to tend their own backyards themselves. As a result, power and influence will be redistributed chaotically and in some cases grudgingly. The modern world is seeing four main issues, he says. One, globalisation is on the retreat. The case for increasing globalisation has been countered by a growing backlash, particularly picking up steam after the financial crash of 2008. This has seen the growth in nationalism and the promotion of more isolationist agendas. While it's impossible to abolish globalisation in this interconnected world, it's certainly been slowed down or even put into reverse. There is an interesting point made here. He quotes the globalisation trilemma framework by Danny Roderick, who said that the three notions of economic globalisation, political democracy and the nation state are mutually irreconcilable. You can have two at the same time, but not three. So take Europe. It has growing economic integration with the single currency and free movement and growing political democracy at the EU level. And that can only be achieved by reducing the importance and the role of the nation state. Which of course is exactly why Britain ultimately opted for Brexit. Because it wasn't prepared to abandon the strength of its own nation state. And therefore if the nation state has a resurgence across the world then it will be at the expense of globalisation. Perhaps we'll see the shortening of supply chains to become regional rather than global. And the pandemic may prompt that as well, since a number of supply chains proved not to be robust once nations were all competing for scarce resources, e.g. for PPE equipment. Global trade might therefore contract and protectionism rise. And so the steady progress we've made in reducing poverty in developing countries may well go heavily into reverse. Second issue, global governance failures. We're facing more global challenges with the pandemic, climate change and the like. Global governance measures such as the WHO with the pandemic have, let's face it, not been effective. If we face global problems that require a global response, we don't have effective mechanisms to facilitate that. To the disappointment of some, maybe, he does not call for a unified global government. He simply argues that the existing international institutions need to be made functional with the cooperation of nation states. Three, the growing rivalry between China and the US. China has been quick to try and fill in the gaps left by the US in recent years. Schwab notes this. Analysts and forecasters who specialise in China, the US or both have access to more or less the same data and information, see, hear and read more or less the same things, but sometimes reach diametrically opposed conclusions. 
Some see the US as the ultimate winner. Others argue that China has already won. And a third group states that there'll be no winners. And fourth, fragile and failing states. A number of countries will be hit especially hard in the post-COVID world. Countries that rely heavily on commodities for their income, for instance. The current collapse in energy and commodity prices is already hitting some of them. Countries with poor infrastructure, petro-states like Ecuador or Venezuela. Countries in the Middle East like Lebanon that were already close to collapse. So that's the geopolitical reset. And then there's the environmental one, which is focused on ecosystem collapse and climate change. These issues share five features with pandemics, according to Schwab. One, they're known. Two, they're non-linear, meaning you can hit catastrophic effects after hitting unknown tipping points. Three, the probabilities and distribution of effects are hard to measure or predict. Four, they're global in nature, and he says they can only be addressed at a global level. And five, they disproportionately affect the most vulnerable countries and segments of the population. And he also talks about the technological reset. The pandemic has pushed people hugely to depend on technologies that they probably wouldn't have engaged with previously. The growth of AI and the use of automation in a world where human involvement may be seen then as more risky. And the growth in surveillance systems and the danger of such systems leading to a dystopian vision that people will initially accept for the health benefits and then come to regret. In fact, he quotes a dark warning by Yevgeny Morozyov talking about government use of apps to respond to a pandemic. On the one hand, there are progressive solutionists who believe that the appropriate exposure through an app to the right information about infection could make people behave in the public interest. On the other hand, there are punitive solutionists determined to use the vast digital surveillance infrastructure to curb our daily activities and punish any transgressions. But this is the kicker. What Morozov perceives as the greatest and ultimate danger to our political systems and liberties is that the successful example of tech in monitoring and containing the pandemic will then entrench the solutionist toolkit as the default option for addressing all other existential problems, from inequality to climate change. After all, it is much easier to deploy solutionist tech to influence individual behaviour than it is to ask difficult political questions about the root causes of these crises. So ironically, Schwab is warning here about the very thing lots of people are now assuming is the actual intent of the Great Reset. So that's a lot of the analysis in the context. What about some of the solutions? When Schwab founded the Global Economic Forum, he had in mind the promotion of what he thought should be the future, broadly described as stakeholder capitalism. Again, this is a label that some people have distorted in the telling, but it comes as a part of a world that I inhabited for the last 20 years of corporate responsibility. So here's the short version. The premise, my words, Capitalism has been the most successful creator of wealth in history. It's a crucial driving force in our future success, but no system's perfect. And the problem with corporate capitalism is that companies have incentives to offload the cost of their negative impacts onto others. So a company makes a profit with a polluting process. It pockets the profits. We, the taxpayers, end up paying to clean up the pollution. So the real question is this. Can you adapt the model, tweak it, so that companies behave more like citizens, taking the responsibility as well as the benefits of what they do. At that level, most people would agree that might well be a desirable thing. The question is, of course, how do you do it? People on the left are only ever likely to come up with ways that are ultimately about undermining the aspect of free markets that actually makes them work in the first place. Schwab supports the idea of stakeholder capitalism where different groups whose well-being is impacted by a corporation, employees, shareholders, local communities, government, suppliers, they gain equal weight in company decision-making, rather than it simply being driven by shareholders. Personally, I've never been attracted by that concept. I think you run the risk of introducing non-pragmatic, maybe even ideological elements into how businesses make decisions, and that will undermine their strengths. I think it's a bad idea. I don't think it's a badly motivated idea. It's not designed with evil intent, as some are suggesting. I think it's appropriate that people are debating it. We believe in debate and free speech, after all. 
Although Schwab has had it at the heart of his thinking for the decades over the life of his big talking shop, that is the World Economic Forum, I haven't seen signs that that specific take is winning the argument. There are plenty of signs that the argument that businesses need to take account of their impacts keeps society on board by not trashing communities where they're based. I think that argument has been slowly gaining ground. Unfortunately, the interest in some companies in getting ideological and embracing the woke agenda has also emerged as a trend. A lot of people confuse the two. Those businesses are going to struggle if they go down that path, in my personal view, because an ideologically run company loses its pragmatism, which is its superpower. All right, so look, where does that leave us? Here's my take. We believe in free speech and forums that can fearlessly put ideas forward and have them probed, attacked, supported and challenged. That's going to help us to solve whatever problems we have to solve. And I think the World Economic Forum is and should be part of that. It's a fine talking shop, so long as it remembers that it's just a talking shop. Caroline Casey, the amazing legally blind woman I interviewed for the podcast, who challenges big corporations to pr properly provide opportunities for people with disabilities in the workplace. She is just one of those who I know has used a platform at the World Economic Forum to engage some of the people that matter in a debate on what they could do better. Those things are the bulk of what happens there, and that's a good thing. However, the message that globalisation is in retreat is an important message. I don't agree with Klaus Schwab that the emergence of global problems can only be addressed with a globalist mindset. Indeed, every instance we've ever seen of centralised power for a large population or geography tends towards inefficiency, out-of-touch leadership, bureaucracy, corruption. All things that are unhelpful in the face of a problem to be solved, let alone a crisis. And there is a crisis of global governance, and it's largely created by the vehicles for global governance, the WHO, the UN and all the rest, because indeed they are inefficient, out of touch, corrupt and weighed down by bureaucracy. Simply wishing that they were more effective won't turn them into trustworthy vehicles for action. Unfortunately, by dressing up the resistance to globalist elites as absurd accusations of global Marxist conspiracies just makes it easier for those that have a globalist mindset to see those dislike ratios on the World Economic Forum YouTube channel and dismiss it as just another ridiculous conspiracy theory. I say that knowing full well this video might get a similar ratio, by the way. Won't be the first time, probably won't be the last. At some point, we're going to have to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. There are times when we do need to think globally. That doesn't mean we want a global government. People in charge absolutely need to stay in touch with the people that are proud of their country and embedded within their community. How those people feel and what they need. You need the localist mindset. In this modern world, with all its technology and knowledge, you'd think we might be able to aspire to do both. Right now, it seems to be either or. And that is a real conflict of values that won't just go away.